Radio Richard. So I had this notion of working with Mark Knopfler because I wanted to change the Muscle Shoal sound from uh, it's a custom sonority. Over the years, I would always try to make a little bit of change in the sound so that you wouldn't seem to be getting the same backgrounds, the same licks, the same uh, uh, presentation by the same band. So I would sometimes add another ingredient from the outside. Uh, I might bring in another keyboard player or bring in another guitarist. In other words, to take a new element and mix it with the known element to create what I call the aesthetic rub because that little rub can generate some sparks of creativity and of new interest. So that was one of my notions. You know, and Bob Dylan is so wise. He is, he is so sagacious. He knows so much more because his riff is putting on the world and putting everybody on with the uh, off-the-wall answers and with the oblique responses and so on. But he knows because when I said, uh, I think I'd like to try Mark Knopfler instead of using any of the lead guitarists down there, he said, yeah, he said, he does me better than anybody. He was so knowledgeable. So I, I don't remember the exact sequence, but before we went to Muscle Shoals, we were in L.A. and Dire Straits was playing, maybe at the Troubadour, I'm not sure. And Bob was there, so we all went together. Because it was a good indoctrination for Bob to hear the band and so on. And Bob, it, Bob gave it the okay. So uh, it was agreed that we would take Mark Knopfler to Muscle Shoals to play lead guitar. Now, Mark Knopfler's sound has often been compared to the sound of J.J. Cale, a great, probably not as well-known musician as he should be, because he's really colossal very shy, very quiet, great songwriter, great player, great singer. He's had his own records, and there's a cult for him in Europe. As is often the case, uh, some of our great American players uh, get their props overseas instead of here. And uh, so I said to Mark, let's try something a little different. I said, instead of playing Mark Knopfler, ally J.J. Cale, I said, play Albert King. So Albert King is one of the two kings, not quite as known as B.B., but people who know the business and who know the blues know that Albert King was a monster guitar player, a great formidable presence. And so it was sort of a joke between me and Mark about changing up the sound. But it was a gag that we all went along with. And uh, we finished the album, Slow Train Coming. Uh, and I'm real, real proud of that album because I think Bob got, got what he wanted. Very important, Bob got a Grammy out of it for the song You Gotta Serve Somebody. It was like the rock song of the year that year. I think it was the next session when we did Save, the second album we did in Muscle Shoals with Bob. I'm not sure of the timing, but he said, uh, hey, when I'm nominated for the Grammy, what do you think we should look like? I said, why don't you blow everybody's mind and all of you wear tuxedos? And there we were at the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion. The curtain goes up. There's Bob Dylan and his bandits. They're all in tuxedos. and. Uh, the place just exploded. And that's my story. <laughs> Great. Uh, I, I'd now like you to talk about uh, Ari Pardini yeah. and uh, his contribution and what it was like to work with him and uh, most specifically about uh, the Dusty and Memphis album, 
uh, about uh, working with Aretha, Donny Hathaway, all these guys? No, I mean, Arif Mardin is Arif Mardin, and when he does string parts, he does beautiful string parts for each of these people. Uh, Arif Mardin uh, came from a very good Turkish family. Uh, I say good. Um, I'm not talking about their status in society. I'm talking about uh, people who had a history and who had state, they did have status. And uh, they were very highly thought of in Turkey. And the reef wanted to arrange music and he was hoping to write for Duke Ellington. And he came to America and I believe he went to the Berkeley School. And uh, I think Nestor Yerdigan, or maybe Ahmed Nestor together, hired him to come work at Atlantic. And he started more or less as a hey you in the studio, uh, doing you know, little horn charts, little bits and pieces, this and that, whatever was needed, and developed into a superb arranger, not only for horns and strings, but for rhythm as well. Uh, there was one period when Arif, Tom, Dad, and I used to work together in the studio. And we had uh, a lot of fun and a lot of good times and a lot of successful records. And working with people like Donny Hathaway, Aretha Franklin, or Dusty Springfield. Uh, first of all, uh, about a reef. The man is the personification of style, character, and manner. He is the archetypical gentleman of our business. And uh, it comes from within. It's not just a superficial manner. And it was always a joy to work with him because it was a very positive inf influence on me. Because his cool and his suave and his unflappability was a good counterpoint to my mercurial temperament. <laughs> One of the memorable sessions was Dusty in Memphis. I called Arif and Tom Dowd to come to work with me on that. And their contributions were invaluable. That session, the Dusty in Memphis session, was originally supposed to be Dusty in Muscle Shoals. Dusty decided to sign with Atlantic and one of her reasons is because she wanted me to produce her. Whatever induced her that way, I have no idea. But I was a big fan. How could you not be of oh, this beautiful singer? So she came to America, and I was living in Long Island then, as I am now, but in a different town, in Great Neck. And I had prepared for weeks and so she came to the house, we had dinner, and then we sat down in the study, and I started playing songs for her. Well, if I played her one song, I played her 50. And the score was Wexler 50, Springfield 0. <laughs> she didn't like any of the songs. Well, that was very rough. And we had a session scheduled, Muscle Shoals. So she went back home to Blighty. And uh, she still was interested in forging ahead, seeing what we could do. So she came back again some time later. Now, instead of 50 songs, I had 15. Every one of them she had heard before. She was madly in love with them this time. So we took 12 or 13 of them. And we couldn't go to Muscle Shoals, my favorite venue, because we couldn't book it, schedule it. So we booked it in Memphis with a studio called the American Studio, and the band was known as the American Band. And the guiding genius was Chips Bowman, a great get-it-together guy, songwriter, guitarist, all-around music entrepreneur. 
and he had a great band there. And so we went down there. We're very informal. Uh, for example, one time when I went out for the hamburgers, Dusty said, I can't imagine the managing director back home going out for sandwiches. <laughs> so Dusty being Dusty, she would take about four or five hours with makeup every morning because she was a beautiful woman, but she didn't think she was beautiful. And so she had this heavy enamel makeup and the raccoon, dark eyes, and she would have her dresses to the floor, skirts. She was what I call swathed in yard goods, because she didn't think her legs were good. Well, what can I say? She was just a gorgeous woman, and she was, how shall I say, she was very inward a directed person and uh, she didn't like her voice so was she against the world so she didn't do any vocals down there and it really was bothersome to me because I don't like to just lay the singer on to tracks that she didn't participate in but that's the way it was so we went back to New York and we went to some studio on 57th Street I forget who where it's just Arif and I, and maybe Tom. And she started to sing. And we had the tracks, and we had our phones. And she kept saying, more track, feed me more tracks. She wanted more and more volume, more and more. Well, I know from experience that the more track you feed the singer, the softer the impact will be of their vocal. They don't know it, but that's true. This is a generalization. So I'm, I'm always fighting with the singer to give them the minimal, less track, less track, because it makes them push and project more, but not dusty. She had the thing so loud that I took one phone, put it one ear, and I was in shock. She said, more, I can still hear myself. So imagine, without hearing herself, she laid down these fabulous vocals all of them in a day or two. I'm very proud that that record, Dusty and Memphis, Memphis, after her long career, turned out to be her defining record. I think there's general agreement about that. Fabulous. And Bob's your uncle. And Bob's your uncle. <laughs> Fantastic. Jerry, who I think you've seen was a very warm person, actually showed us around his private office in his home in Long Island. And, uh, I don't know about Western Swing. What was that I wanted to say? Uh, I, g I gave all my Western Swing LPs to uh, Ray Benson. And uh, so when Doug Somm died, they did a big interview with me. It was a big interview with it. Doug was the focus of it. And, they said to Ray Benson, oh, what do you think of Jerry Wax? Or something like that. He, uh, he said, well, he gave me, he, he said it must have been three yards of, uh, of albums on Western Swing. I really had the, uh, and he said, I noticed that alongside a lot of the titles were the initials W N, W N. He said, let me make a guess. He's talking to me, he talks about this. He said, was that Willie Nelson? I said, yeah. I had planned a Western Swing album with Willie Nelson, and for several years I kept sending him tapes of songs to do, and we had the session scheduled for his studio in uh, uh, Spicewood, Texas, LBJ country, Burton Alice River. I had a heart attack, and so the session never happened. It was 89. Yeah. <laughs> Well, uh, you want you want to go around? Or? Uh, yeah, I, I'd, I'd let, could we go into the room with your gold sure. records? That'd be just a little nice sure. background stuff. There's no real light. In There's here. no real light. That's, oh, well, that's one of the good things about this. We can have low light. 
actually, it shows up. It does show up, sort of. It's, I'll just go around kind of slowly. For those of you who are in a purely audio world, the camera is currently panning around more gold records than you could fit onto an aircraft carrier and looking at rare paintings and photos from Jerry's inspiring career. Lucky, lucky, lucky us. Oh, here comes an interesting picture. There's three guys on a camel. A caricature of Amit Neswi Erdogan and Jerry riding on the camel's tail. Jerry, could you tell me a little bit about this picture here? Oh, <laughs> uh, when we sold the company, to uh, what became Warner Communications, and we joined with uh, Electra and Warner Records. So it became those were the three labels of, uh, under the Warner banner. Joe Smith, who the president of uh, Warner Records, threw us a big bash, a big party at his house in L.A., and he presented us with this uh, caricature. Somebody said, uh, he said, those Arabs look, look pretty cool, but, but what is the Jewel boy doing to that camel? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I can top that. 1967, it's my 50th birthday. They threw me a party, a lunch, and it was in connection with, I had just been named record executive of the year three years in a row so it was the hat trick and it was a surprise I didn't know it and they took um, and Nestle spurted me out uh, I always used to wear a sweater and was, somehow they made me get dressed you know with a suit and a tie because we were supposed to meet some big deal executive from the Columbia Record Club some bullshit you know and it was a surprise party and if you look here Everybody who came to the party, everybody in the industry, they wrote their name on a little slip of paper, and it was all engraved onto this this uh, silver plate platter. Cool. If you can see the names on there, you know, John Hammond, Bill Gabler, Mitch Miller. So it was quite a uh, quite a souvenir. Jerry is now very kindly showing us his private family photos in his living room. You literally cannot get this content anywhere else. Please subscribe and donate to Radio Richard. Thank you. It's so Radio Richard.